right? We are here with a woman who wears many hats in the world of boxing. She's the president of Boxing Ontario. She's the owner of Kingsway Boxing Club in the GTA. Um, she's the, the list kind of goes on a little bit too long. Trainer, everything else. We've known each other for a long time, but this is the first time that she is on the podcast. Jennifer Huggins, welcome to the Great Fight North Boxing Podcast. Thank you. Honest, honored to be here. Yeah, this is going to be interesting, especially with um, everything that's going on right now and uh, everything that you guys have been kind of working on behind the scenes over the last little while. There's a lot that, that I think uh, boxing fans across Canada and fighters themselves are interested in hearing from, especially from the perspective of the biggest kind of uh, provincial boxing organization in English speaking Canada anyways, for sure. And I have a feeling a lot of people are going to follow what you guys are doing. So I'm um, looking forward to getting into that. But um, not to start on a negative note, Jen, but I do want to talk a little bit about some of the plight that gym owners have been kind of going through over this time. Obviously, with everything coronavirus, we had to shut down all the gyms. Um, these are small businesses. This is not a, an easy thing for these people to do. What have you been seeing, as in, especially in the Ontario region where, where you're kind of in charge? Um, what are these gym owners up against? What's the current situation for them? Um, I know there's been some sad news of closures and stuff too recently. Yeah, that's, uh, it's not been easy for any business. So boxing gyms, small businesses alike, uh, especially considering the fact that a lot of boxing gyms were not already necessarily money makers in the first place. We're not yeah. typically out there to try to make money. We're, we're trying to make a sport and make a life out of the sport for many people. So they weren't, and I think that that's something that uh, has opened my eyes uh, through Boxing Ontario to the fact that we need to help the boxing gyms become more of a business so that they can reach out and get some of the supports that are being out there for them. Hmm. So it's it's been tough. Uh, we've lost a couple of uh, gyms right now. I, I don't have a number to it right now, but I know that, uh, for example, Atlas Boxing Gym, who's been around for ever. I mean, I, yeah. you know, Adrian was a huge influence uh, actually in 2011 when I met you on the direction I actually took boxing. And hmm. you know, it's he's been such a huge influence on a lot of people in the sport. And now his son, who's taken over for him, running that gym, that, you know, they have I've always had a huge contingent of uh, national, international level athletes. Yeah. So it's it's really tough to see them at this point. That to make to make it simple, they made a decision, uh, basically because of a landlord situation, to close their doors for now. I know they'll be back, uh, just like a lot of other gyms that are struggling the way that they're struggling right now. We faced it. You know, I've got two locations in Toronto. It's not cheap to be here. Uh, it never has been. It's way more expensive because all of a sudden, before this you know, big close down for everything for, before the pandemic. I think Toronto was going, you know, really hard and really strong with business. Ontario in general was doing, you know, really big things. Canada overall was doing big things economically. Yeah. So the rent amounts was really reflecting that and it sucked to begin with. And now the hard thing is that the gyms and small businesses are facing paying the same amount of rent with reduced abilities to make. So the, the real estate isn't worth what it was worth like two months, three months ago, it's now worth quite a bit less because, you know, we, we're going to be so limited, which I can get into a little bit with you guys as well. Uh, yeah. We're going to be so limited to what our business is going to be able to look like, at least in the first or second phase of and third phase of what this pandemic is facing us with. Yeah, it, it feels like this is kind of what's going to be happening to pretty much any business that deals with the public in, in a big way, restaurants, all these kinds of places where it's like, how are you going to be able to afford to pay a rent if you're reliant on the number of people that are in your establishment at any given time, right? I mean, it just seems so difficult at this point. It's, I mean, it's, it's ridiculous. I mean, I hate saying that, you know, we are in any way worse off than anyone else. And I think in Canada, the fact that we have qualified to get served, for example, which is $2,000 a month, feels like free money. I hear a lot of the kids, uh, a lot of boxers have been, you know, interacting with me saying, man, this is really cool. You know, I'm going to, I'm going to move away when this is all over. I've got my $8,000 of serve money. It seems like a lot of money. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I know from being a small business, uh, and I've been in business for 15 years now, which is not that long, but it's long enough to know that nothing is for free, especially when it comes from the government. Yeah. So, you know, if we're lucky enough to survive this as a business, uh, and the businesses that are, you know, fortunate enough to be in a position to continue on with business after this, they're going to be paying. We're going to be paying. You know, I, I'm still not sure how we're going to do. Uh, we can't even forecast whether we can keep our doors open 
after you, we go back to business because we have to see what that's going to look like. We don't, we're not in control anymore of what we're able to, uh, I guess, make on classes because they're going to be so limited in size. We're not in control of, we're basically all limited to the same amount of people in our gym and our facilities making the same amount of money, but all having different amounts to pay in rent. Um, yeah. There's some gyms, some gyms have actually started an online uh, program. I mean, they're lucky. The ones who didn't have a gym yet, a facility yet, I would say are in the best position right now than the rest of us. Interesting point. So that's, I mean, so, I mean, to get into some of the stuff, I don't know if you want me to get into that right now, but to get into some of the stuff that we're looking at as gyms, when we are able to open our doors, um, basically, you know, right now, because, so we're fortunate in one respect, Boxing Ontario, because we are recognized by the uh, Ministry of Sport, uh, Heritage, Tourism, we have been classified as a, we are a PSO, so we're a provincial sport, sports organization. I think the push probably uh, in a huge way came from the fact that there are a lot of sports that are trying to get ready for the Olympics in 2021. Right. So there was a push right now. Not all countries have stopped their athletes from training. Many countries actually never stopped their athletes from training in the first place. Some countries didn't close down. We're seeing their numbers with the cases of COVID probably up at the higher levels, but um, on the sports aspect of things, uh, our athletes haven't been training properly to get back into into sport whether they're boxers or you know swimmers or anything swimmers are going to probably be the last ones to get back into things um but as it stands there was an amendment made on may 19th that allowed boxing well not just boxing allowed um sports organizations in ontario to get back to a uh, they call it a return to training a return to sport but in mm. boxing's case it's a return to training uh protocol under strict guidelines released specifically by the sports organization. So boxing actually, on the, out of the combat sports, you can correct me if I'm, I'm wrong, but I believe that boxing was the first to get to it, uh, mainly because, I mean, personally, I'm not there yet as a gym. I'm not personally gonna be opening my doors up right away. We're not, we're not at the stage where I feel like the protocols that we can put into place are going to allow us to open our doors at this moment. We're working really hard to get there and we've got really strict guidelines to follow, but I think a lot of athletes, a lot of boxers, a lot of coaches were already working with their athletes outside doing things that, you know, were not necessarily directed with proper protocols. So I thought, right. I, I think that that kind of really rushed our organization to set up, uh, I, we actually set up a task force. I was getting, personally, I was getting emails, text messages, uh, Facebook messages, like left, right and center. I like don't even check Facebook on a good day. I, I post to it and it's like, into the abyss from there. <laughs> um, so I was getting upwards of a hundred messages per day, uh, asking what to do, how to, you know, what can we do? How do I save my business? How can I start training again? How do I open my gym again? So I just said, okay, we need proper people with proper answers to uh, make sure to be accessible. So we set up a task force uh, of around, I think it was eight people in total. Three of them are doctors. Nice. Uh, yeah, you know, I don't think that any of us really know specifically the perfect ideal situation to step into. <laughs> We're all experts at this point from watching <laughs> enough news, right? But none of us are actually experts. So. Man, I, hope I, don't, I hope I don't upset anybody here, but I'm not going to go drink any Lysol. <laughs> yeah, okay, yeah. good, good. Okay, <laughs> but, glad to hear. Glad to but, hear. We'll still have a president of, uh, of Boxing Ontario tomorrow. That's good. Okay. Oh, it's my it's my goal to make sure that I'm actually not necessarily all that important to the organization. That's been one of the reasons why the task force represents a committee. Mm. Um, I I know that one person is only as good as one person can be, and really at the end of the day, we have a huge organization. You mentioned it before. Uh, uh, you almost Quebec would have come after you if you said that we were the biggest because. Uh, but you said biggest English speaking. Uh, so we surpassed us in numbers of members and clubs uh, mm. but they really helped us out in Ontario here nice. make sure that when we closed down we actually had the proper protocols in place and were able to communicate properly with our members they all the way through really helped us out but Ontario is huge we've got like again right now as it stands we're around 150 gyms um, I think over 2,000 members wow. yeah we're, we're absolutely massive hopefully we stay up there at that number after all yeah. of this is over we're, the members will stay the same some of the clubs might have to combine i have to give props to uh to come back for the fact that there's a lot of gyms that work out of each other's gyms so there's pro yeah. gym with amateur gyms who are working out of them sometimes multiple um multiple coaches with multiple gyms set up yeah. i think ontario might have to learn from that uh just considering the fact that 
it's so expensive right now to be able to try to open a location, especially yeah. with the situation. So yeah, we're we're really trying to figure out a way of making sure that we facilitate a, a safe return to sport. And all of that is really, there's a lot to it. So we can talk about that if you guys are interested. But. Yeah, we'll get to it for sure. Yeah, for sure. We'll get to it for sure. Yeah, so I guess let's take it back kind of pre-pandemic and, you know, you're the president of Boxing Ontario. So how where does like Boxing Ontario sit in terms of, you know, being under Boxing Canada and how does all that kind of work and go together? And especially in this situation, like what is Boxing Canada doing to help with the situation also? So Boxing Ontario is uh, obviously a provincial sports organization under the NSO, which is a national sports organization. Uh, but because we're so big, I think, I think it would change province by province if you ask them this. Um, mm. Because we're so big, we're almost self-contained, we're self-coordinated. Um, and that's something that we really realized, I think, with the new board that came in, that we have so much opportunity right here in Ontario that doesn't even affect Canada. It doesn't even, we answer to Canada through our sanctioning, through our insurance, through what we do, through our memberships. However, there's going to be a lot of things and a lot of opportunities and pathways for the athletes, for the coaches, for the clubs in general, that will never reach the national level and will never necessarily reach the um, national supports. On the end of COVID and how we are getting supported by Canada, uh, they re recently released a uh, protocol. Uh, it was, I think, an eight-page uh, document that we are able to pull from as provinces. But unfortunately, because each province is returning to uh, phase one, to whatever phase, right. uh, different times, Canada can only give, uh, I guess, recommend different protocols that might be helpful. At this point right now, Ontario really had to figure it out on our own, which is yeah. why we have this task force that's really trying to make sure that we're on top of all of what Ontario is allowing uh, through phase one, and hopefully the next phase opens things up a little bit. But yeah, as much as, as, much as we tried to lean on Canada, it was really clear when we saw their protocols come out that a lot of it didn't even relate to Ontario. Interesting. So now let's talk a little bit about that task force that you put together and some of the results that you ended up getting out of it. First off, I think that's fantastic that you brought in other pros and people that actually know, you know, the, the ins and outs of something as uh, difficult to understand as, as a pandemic in, in, in this current kind of climate here. So that's, first of all, that big kudos on that. I know there are some organizations out there that may want to try and just handle everything themselves and they're, you know, be too big for your britches. And I think that's a great move on your guys's part. So how did you um, get those doctors together? And then let's go through what the new normal is going to look like, at least for the short term here in Ontario. Cool. So again, the long and short of it was I, you know, I recognized immediately when the first day of the pandemic or first day of the shutdown, the emergency order where everybody shut down, I recognized that the number of questions I was getting, I was way out of my depths in being able to answer those. I mean, I don't have the answers to everything. I'm not scared to tell people I don't know. Um, and I would like to, I know, I do know that there's people out there that have better answers than I do and clearer, right. <laughs> obviously clearer responses. So um, the COVID task force only got uh, kind of prepared about probably a month, month and a half into things. It's not just doctors. We've got three ringside doctors who have always been involved with uh, not just boxing, but also uh, Faisal. I mean, he's probably going to kill me for pronouncing his name wrong. Uh, Faisal Ryman, who is a, uh, do, you know, do you know who he is? I've, he, I'm he, sure that sounds I've familiar. Yeah. 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 He's been a ringside doctor. He's always on TV, does all the, uh, all the Muay Thai stuff, uh, okay. all the wacko kickboxing stuff. And then also he has done a lot of boxing uh, things. He's a crazy, amazing doctor. He's got tattoos across his chest. Look him up. Uh, he'd be a great one to bring on this podcast. Nice. Okay. Um, so he, he was really great because he was already crossed over into uh, the Muay Thai and the kickboxing world. Uh, so there's also uh, Adam Zudis, who is our ringside doctor for Ontario. So he's kind of like our medical commissioner for Ontario. He's been incredible. He's a very accessible doctor and very knowledgeable and very interested in helping the sport of boxing, donates nice. a lot of his time to the sport. And then Payam Sadra, who's a good friend of mine, just got him into the sport a couple of years ago. Uh, he is a really fun doctor. Uh, we, was, we were hanging out a lot and I just said to him, doctor. All right. he wanted, well, he wanted to be a ringside doctor for the UFC. He was like, I want to go zero to 60. I was like, how about you start with some amateur stuff where we really need you and yeah. then like go to the big leagues. Yeah, and, yeah, I so like I, that. Yeah, so it's pretty cool. It's uh, th Those guys have been awesome. And then 
I had Sid Vanderpool, who is uh, one of my board members. He helped pull together the uh, the team, and he chose from a lot of the members actually of Boxing Ontario. Uh, we want to empower them. I think that that's kind of the next step with Boxing Ontario is kind of empowering the membership to mm. get things done, uh, not just you know, it leaning on the organization to get it done, but actually yeah. pulling the organization together as a membership. Yeah. You know, it sounds it sounds really great. It's still a lot of work. Um, it's still really interesting to try to get these guys together on the same page. But the great thing is with the COVID task force, the members who are on that team are all interested in the same thing. We all want to get back to boxing for yeah. you know, one reason or another, whether it's for business, activity, mental uh, sanity. For sure. So, yeah, so it's a really great team of members, doctors, and just experts who can help us move in the right direction and move together into that direction. Fantastic. So you guys came up with with a, a bunch of protocols, and then I believe this past Thursday, you guys did a kind of a roundtable with um, gym owners from all over Ontario. How many people uh, roughly were involved in, in, in the conversation? So we had upward of 160 people join. Wow. The, yeah, it was, it was pretty incredible. I, actually, it wasn't just... So only BC is open right now for uh, boxing or for sport. Uh, mm. They're the only ones who open their doors. Uh, and again, their protocols are very different than ours are. So we actually had, uh, I guess, representatives, executive directors and presidents from different provinces also join us. So that number represented uh, clubs, boxers, coaches, uh, and other provinces who are looking at what our next steps are gonna be. So uh, we held that round table on Thursday, you're right. Uh, the next steps. So we outlined kind of next steps. Uh, the COVID task force did an incredible job at bringing together resources as much as even putting together a package of print work. So they designed all of the print work that the gyms need to put up. Uh, specific, nice. Yeah, specific to the boxing gyms. Good. Um, designed by a designer. The designer donated their time to be able to do that. And then the print work was for the entire package going to be $8. Like I was like, wow. oh, I'm in there. Yeah. Amazing. So two locations for me, I just ordered two packages. And now I know that when I'm ready to open my doors, I've got all the necessary signage. So I won't get those tickets from those bylaw officers, which yeah. I have a really big issue with. I won't get into that right now. Okay. Uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, so uh, the next step now will be, we release the protocols, we release all the information. And now before any boxing gym can return to operating, which could be as soon as Monday, they have to participate in a seminar. And the seminar will be with the task force. Um, I will be one of the, the, sorry, one of the facilitators along with a couple of doctors have uh, offered to be able to help as well. Um, Fred, yeah, Fred Tenike is the, uh, he's another board member. He's the uh, kind of head of the task force kind of uh, communication end of things. So we're gonna be starting with 30 uh, clubs tomorrow, uh, tomorrow evening at 6 p.m. That, yeah, that seminar is full but we have seminars right now, uh, two more next week, and then we're gonna keep launching these seminars as needed just to help facilitate the gyms to open up. So there's gonna be mandatory for each gym to be able to open. Yeah, I think- okay, the good to know. That was, so that was actually, um, that was a call that I kind of suggested because knowing how much information's out there and knowing yeah. that even a lot of the clubs didn't have to come to that town hall on Thursday, there's so many questions, even after, during the town hall, I was the one kind of coordinating the, the chat and the questions that were coming into me, even though we were saying the words that they needed to hear, were yeah. echoing the same questions that we were already answering. So we're gonna do much smaller seminars where the uh, coaches, we can actually get a clear idea that the coaches understand the protocols, they're gonna implement the protocols. More importantly, they understand how not implementing will have huge implications on the sport. It Exactly. That's, that's kind of where I was going to go with this is that, yeah, okay, mandatory. It could sound frustrating. It could sound like more rules and red tape, but the, the cost of something going wrong at this point is pretty big, I would assume. Yeah, that was, that was actually my biggest, uh, my biggest issue when the task force brought the protocols to me and it was the board of directors making the decision that, yes, we're okaying these protocols. I was like, that's a heavy, heavy weight to put on a board of directors' shoulders. And it's a big responsibility we're putting into the club's hands. And we have to trust that the clubs are going to, you know, implement these things. And even if they do, even if they put these protocols in, we, again, it is such a strange situation we're finding ourselves in with COVID that, I mean, we don't, we have to do everything we can and we don't want any mess ups. Number one, because we don't want to have a death. We don't want to have somebody get sick and, you know, we don't want to lose someone because of our inability to um, implement the protocols mm. or number two, we don't want to end up boxing being the reason why we have another shutdown. Yeah. So, yeah. That's, yeah. Big deal. that's the last thing that we want at this point. I, I would agree with that. No question. Yeah. So like 
obviously me and Jason, we talk and everybody, we've talked so much, you know, how does boxing come back? And when we say that we're talking about pro boxing. So obviously we're quite a long ways away from, you know, actual amateur fights coming back. Like what are, you know, me and Jason have talked about the challenges of pro boxing coming back. What are the challenges of amateur boxing coming back? Obviously it doesn't have the same, you know, revenue as pro boxing does. Yeah, uh, I, I actually have stayed away from the pro game just because I don't understand it well enough. And I know that everything that I, I take a step into, I start wanting to do it better. So I don't know uh, even who sanctions or really uh, implements protocols for pro boxing. So I'm actually curious if you guys know what kind of protocols, because they with this whole um, phase one lift where they're allowing provincial sports organizations to allow their athletes and their, their sports to return to training, it, it, it included pro, it included pro boxing. Hmm. So I don't know what that looks like for them. Maybe they'll follow some of our protocols, but uh, because there are a lot of gyms that are pro and amateur, so it, it will mean that just a byproduct of that fact alone, they will have to follow a lot of our protocols. Hmm. The protocols right now are so strict and not, not just from Boxing Ontario, but they're so strict from the government where you're only allowed to have like five people in your gym. That includes your trainer. Um, yeah. And they have to be spaced out six feet from each other. The bags have to be, uh, or recommended to be three to four meters away from each other. Wow. Yeah, yeah. It, this, is, this is like the, the challenge. So right now we're physically getting people back in the gyms, not for the gyms to survive, but for the boxers to be able to mentally get back into the game. Yeah. Which is great. Um, but at the same time, there's gonna be no contact, not even pad work. Uh, so we're not right now under Boxing Ontario's uh, protocols. We're not sanctioning pad work as being a safe, safe return to sport. Okay. okay. Um, so simply because, as we know now, and this is coming from the doctors, that you know any kind of particles entering through the eyes, the nose, whatever, even if you're wearing a mask, you, you know you could be wearing glasses or you could be wearing those visors. I mean, imagine what the boxers are looking at when they're looking at you wearing a hazmat suit, essentially. <laughs> I actually posted, I was like one of my posts, I don't post that often, but it was like a hazmat suit boxer at the very beginning of all this, yeah, yeah, like yeah. throwing punches. And I was like, yeah, that's pretty much how boxing's going to look in the future. I think, I think that some of the guys are so excited to get back into it that they would happily don a hazmat suit yeah. at this point to be able to do it from, from the guys that we've talked to. I know it, it, it is crazy. Okay. So actually this is a good time to, to kind of list out a few more of those things. So three to four meters apart. Is that what you had said? For bags. So for yeah, bags. for bags. Yeah, okay. so I mean, I actually, on Boxing Ontario's website, we have up the, the official protocols. Uh, okay. So it's, it's a three, it's a three page document. I'll send okay. it to you guys. Yeah. yeah. You guys, it's not, it, you know, I don't want to bore you with it. I, I, okay. definitely, I should read it. And but highlights, we're, we're talking big space, no pad work, obviously no sparring at that point, and very minimal people in the gym at a given time. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, I, I know that it's five households, but five maximum people. It's very confusing. That's why and it's changing every day. Yeah. So as long as the first phase comes in well, and they move on to the second phase by mid June, I know that June 9th or June 15th, I can't remember what day they're supposed to announce that. But as long as we do our part and step by step phase it back in without having a raise in cases, yeah. then then we're in okay shape to start doing more. But I was on a call with Boxing Canada. And you know, we don't at this point, you know, even from the national perspective, they don't see us returning to any kind of competition. It's going to be tough to even think that it's going to happen this year. Like it, we, ha wow. we have to, I, I, we hope, like we're, we're keeping our fingers crossed. We've got athletes in Ontario. We have four athletes who are waiting to get back into training and waiting to get back into comp and competition is a big part of training for, for boxing. It's like, it's like trying to get a, a swimmer, an Olympic level swimmer to swim without water. Like, how do you know yeah. if this is working? Yes. Yeah you know, swimmer into water. It's the same thing for boxing. You can look really great. You've got all these incredible challenges out there, like shadow boxing challenges, and it's keeping people engaged. It's keeping people excited, but boxers who need to compete, pro boxers even worse, who need to, you know, see if their work is actually translating into effective techniques, yep. need to spar, need to compete to be able to see what that looks like. 100%. So, you know, and that's, that's even, more than just the money that you can make. So boxing, yeah, I, sorry, I'm really bad. I'm a horrible person to interview. You, you'd ask me about the, <laughs> you'd, ask, you'd ask me about the idea of uh, financially, yeah, it's gonna take a huge toll on, you know, boxing, amateur boxing. We have, you know, Boxing Ontario, we're, we're not too bad off when it comes to being able to put on competitions. We actually had three 
booked competitions uh, with with hotels that we now have on hold that we might lose the um, we might I mean, it's not fair if they actually take the deposit from us yeah. but we might lose a deposit if we don't get that opportunity to you know hold those competitions sometime in the next year but uh, yeah so right now as it stands we don't know when we're going to return to competition and you know it is having a huge effect on the sport um, business wise it'll have a huge effect just the same as the pros it'll have a huge effect on the businesses uh, not being able to offer certain programs but yeah, yeah that's that's the reality we're facing wow. right now so at this point now, the good news at the very least is that gyms in a very limited capacity, but it open nonetheless, as soon as this coming week, right up here with the protocols that are listed on the Boxing Ontario website. Uh, but competition, that's a whole other conversation for, for a later date once we have a better idea of what's going on and travel and all that kind of stuff, right? Yeah, I mean, we're, yeah. we're open to doing local competitions within Ontario, but again, yeah nothing's nothing with the protocols we have in place with this phase and we don't know even the next phase we're lucky because we're not considered just a fitness gym that like because boxing gyms are registered with boxing ontario there is a sanctioning with that and every now the one thing that does have to change our doors are not just opening we do have to have every uh person who comes to the door of a boxing gym to partake in boxing activities even though they're not sparring be registered as a minimum recreational member which we never really had that high of memberships for recreational in the first place is what did it come with now yeah. it comes with something great it comes with the ability to come back to training before the next phase that allows you to do that because we okay. don't know yeah we don't know that, when it's coming back that's big then okay so ne that's the next thing we wanted to talk about um to to kind of wrap it up for people who are really interested in getting back into this at this point now if you're a kind of a, a casual boxing um, workout uh, athlete, let's say, that enjoys going, like I go to our mutual friend, Eric Belanger's gym, uh, final round here in Ottawa once in a while, hit the bags, do some pad work with him. Um, people like me, to be able to go into a gym at this point, need to be registered with Boxing Ontario, and if so, how do they do that? Yeah, so uh, we're going to be going through that again. The one major step before the gyms can open is they have to partake in a uh, seminar. Tomorrow we have 30 people, 30 gyms partaking in that seminar. We're going to make sure that each of the gyms have access to it. Um, regular boxers have to be, so yourself, for example, you know, you just want to get in there, hit the bag again. Um, you have to register as a recreational member. It only costs $20 okay. per year. Okay. Very simple, $20 per year for the option to be able to work out. Now that doesn't go to the gym. It goes directly to Boxing Ontario. Okay. Um, the boxers or the recreational members are now sanctioned and licensed and insured by Boxing Ontario cool. uh, for safe sport protocols that we're implementing right now. It's always been a thing, but again, nobody really knew the uh, benefit to being a recreational member. Yeah. And it should come now, I, and we're talking about how it's going to look, but it'll come with a, a card that says you're registered for the year. Nice. Um, so the clubs, the clubs should be supplying that to you. So when you know when you go back to training with Eric, he should give you a uh, form that you can fill out and you just give him 20 bucks, sends that in, you're good to go. Excellent. Okay. Well, I think that's actually a good spot to kind of leave people off because that's a positive note that uh, has got me pretty excited, to be honest. And the, the, the idea of things starting to get back to some semblance of normalcy in our sport. And, uh, you know, really, it all begins at the grassroots level. Um, and on the amateur level where you're, you're in charge. So it's a lot of pressure on you, Ms. Huggins. Uh, I appreciate um, all the work that you guys have put in in order to get the sport back in business here. And uh, I hope that we can do a recap coming up soon to figure out how the first implementation has gone and talk a little bit about when competition can start again and, and some of those kinds of things. And we've had, we have tons of questions about Boxing Ontario versus Boxing Ontario and all, uh, Boxing Canada rather. Um, but we'll get to that in another episode. This was a lot of information, I think, to digest for everybody. Uh, but thank you again for all your hard work. And thanks for coming on to the Great Fight North Boxing Podcast, Jen. Thanks for having me, guys. Can't wait to see you guys again soon, hopefully in the gym.